You're listening to the Wisdom for Wellbeing podcast, the show that blends science and heart to bring you evidence-based tips and tricks for cultivating a healthy, wealthy, and meaningful life. Now, here's your host, therapist, yogi, and fellow full life balancer, Dr. Caitlin Harkis. Well, hello there. Welcome to Wisdom for Wellbeing. I have been looking forward to having Professor Paul Gilbert on Wisdom for Wellbeing since this podcast began because I have been so influenced by his work, both personally and professionally. What we're going to be talking about here is compassion. And you're going to see that while self-compassion is talked about a lot, it is not the only form of compassion. And what I love about Paul's work, in addition to what you'll see as the broadness of his focus on compassion, is that he doesn't shy away from acknowledging the dark side of humanity. You know, our tendency to violence, to vengefulness, Yet, you will also be hearing that he's very clear on the skills and the practices that we can develop to ensure that we contribute to the cultivation of a compassionate world, a connected world, a world in which we and each other can feel safe and secure. So I'll share a bit more about Paul with you before I formally introduce him. But first, I just wanted to take a quick moment to let you know that this is the first of two episodes whereby the interview with Paul will continue into a second episode. Paul's depth of wisdom could not be contained to a single episode duration. So please make sure you tune in next week to catch the second part of the interview, particularly as that is where Paul is going to introduce you to compassion cultivating exercises, both in the form of mind awareness, as well as body-based practices that ultimately enable your body to better support your mind, which of course, you know that I love given all of my work and practice in body-based yogic wisdom traditions. I think you'll see how the vagus nerve, something we've talked about in episodes past, comes up here as well. So Paul Gilbert, Professor Gilbert, is a professor of clinical psychology at the University of Derby and an honorary visiting professor at the University of Queensland. Until his retirement from the National Health Service in 2016, he was a consultant clinical psychologist for over 40 years. He has researched evolutionary approaches to psychopathology with a special focus on mood, shame, and self-criticism in various mental health difficulties for which compassion-focused therapy was actually developed. He was made a fellow of the British Psychological Society in 1993, and he was president from 2002 to 2004, and he was a member of the first British government's NICE Guidelines for Depression. He has written and edited over 23 books, 300 papers and book chapters. And in 2006, he established the Compassionate Mind Foundation as an international charity with a mission statement to promote well-being through the scientific understanding and application of compassion. Please head to compassionatemind.co.uk. There are now a number of sister foundations in other countries, including Australia. And he was awarded an OBE by the Queen in March 2011 for services to mental health. He established and is the director of the Center of Compassion Research and Training at Derby University in the UK. His latest book is a major edited book with Professor G. Simos in 2012. Oh, pardon me. In 2022, this came out. It's called Compassion, Clinical Practice, and Applications. So as you can see, Professor Gilbert is very well established from not having just founded compassion-focused therapy, but to really be offering up opportunities for individuals to engage with this treatment approach, to upskill, to learn. So without further ado, let me introduce you to Professor Paul Gilbert now. 
Professor Gilbert, welcome to Wisdom for Wellbeing podcast. I am really delighted to get the chance to sit down with you virtually today, you know, halfway across the world. It's so lovely to be here together. Well, thank you very much, um, Caitlin, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me. It's always a great pleasure to be able to talk about CFT, so that's great fun. Uh, I'm so excited. So for listeners, CFT is Compassion Focused Therapy, which is um, going to be essentially our deep dive today. And Professor Gilbert, you are the developer, you know, you're a big advocate of Compassion Focused Therapy. Would you mind just sharing us a little bit about who you are and sort of how you came to be here today and to develop something that's so profound? Okay, well, um <clears throat> I was a clinical, well, in fact, originally I was an economist, actually, and then I changed over and did a, a degree in psychology and did my PhD on depression in Edinburgh back in the 70s. So I've been a clinical psychologist for a while, and I worked in the NHS for 40 years and had a research unit there. And my interest has always been in evolutionary approaches to mental health difficulties. And one of the reasons for that was because when I was in um, Edinburgh, a lot of the researchers in the unit I was on was doing works on drugs and brain chemistry. And uh, if you didn't talk about brain chemistry, you didn't have any friends. So I learned a lot about brain chemistry, <clears throat> but I was one of a number of psychologists that were suggesting that, it wasn't my suggestion, I was just going along with the crowd, uh, that um, a lot of the changes we see in states like depression and anxiety could be the result of psychological and social processes. So we know that when people are depressed, they have a change in their brain state. You know, they feel terrible, they don't sleep, and, and uh, they, they become very um, disengaged and lose energy. So there's a lot of physical changes in depression, but we wanted to explore the degree to which those physical changes are very important, uh, could be linked to uh, psychological and social processes, and therefore reversing them, if you want to use that term, could also be linked to psychological and social processes. So that was what we call brain state theory. And if you want me to say the kind of psychologist I am, then that's what I am. And my first book in 84 was called From Psychology to Brain State, Depression from Psychology to Brain State. So that's where it began. And then you have to think, okay, so what, what's regulating these brain states? And the next thing from an evolutionary point of view is to think about the basically motivational systems. So think about if you're motivated to find food, your brain will be orientated in a particular kind of way. If you're motivated to run away from a lion, <laughs> your brain will be in a different state. If you're motivated to have children or look after your children, if you're motivated to sex or whatever. So different motivations really have a big impact on how your brain states are operating. And in compassion focused therapy, what we are arguing is that if you can develop, if you can stimulate, if you can uh, uh, work with a caring motivation which is hundreds of millions of years old it has a particular type of physiological brain state if you can stimulate those brain states that are linked to the motivation for caring and not sex not not competing not running away from life the, the motivation of caring that has a massive impact on how your body and your brain works so that was really some of the science behind compassion focused therapy we want to stimulate a particular motivational system, which has been evolving over millions of years. And when we do that, we can help people change their brain state. So that was part of the, the theory of it all, really. That's the science behind it. And so you, as, as a young, well, first economist, that doesn't surprise me Then you're really interested in, you know, evolutionary science and sort of these, these motivational drives. So what I'm That's hearing right. is that Compassion-focused therapy is really based on evolutionary science and these drives. How would you define compassion? Because I don't think everyone is necessarily immediately going to associate compassion with evolution. So could you just give us, Professor Gilbert, a bit of a sense as to what compassion is for you? <laughs> what a wonderful question, because compassion is one of the most profoundly important motives that humans have evolved. There is no motivation more profoundly important to humanity than compassion. So what? How, how does it evolve? Well, the first thing is that all motivations are algorithms. What do we mean by an algorithm? Well, everything works by algorithms, even this computer and, and so forth. What it means is that in a situation of A, if A arises, then do B. 
Now, your body has many of these algorithms. For example, if you get very cold, then you will start shivering. If cold, then shiver, because that helps to keep you know, blood temperature. On the other hand, if you get very hot in one of your Australian summers, uh, then you will start to perspire. Now, you don't learn that. Your body has that already. It's if A, then do B. And we have many of these motivations. For example, if a threat appears in your environment, then stimulate a part of your brain called your amygdala, become anxious, run away, or whatever. If, on the other hand, you see food, you don't want to be running away. <laughs> You want your saliva to just get going, your stomach acids, and for you to go and eat, right? Because on the other hand, it's sexuality. You don't want to do that unless you're Hannibal Lecter or something. Uh, you want to have your body stimulated, ready for sexual behavior. So if A, then do B. So what is it for compassion? It's caring. And that is evolved with the parent-child. Well, one of the roots is parent-child. And many, many species look after their infants, don't they? And therefore, the issue is, if in distress, if your infant is in distress or in need of feeding or whatever, then do be. In other words, address that distress, address that need in your infant. So if the need arises, if distress or suffering or whatever arises, that triggers in the mother, not just staying on a mobile phone, but actually attending to the infant. So if A, do B. Now that's compassion right so how do we define it right once you understand it as an algorithm mm -hmm. then it becomes sensitivity to distress in self and others that's the a that's the first bit to be sensitive to engage to be prepared to move towards another way and then the second bit is and then act appropriately to address that and try and prevent it in the future now that means that really the most important aspects of compassion, sensitivity to suffering and a commitment to do something about it, is courage and wisdom. Because I think in one of your other questions, you say, isn't compassion seen as soft and weak? Well, no. Uh, it, I mean, you know, there are some people that talk about tender and all that, but we don't do that. For example, if you're a firefighter, you will risk your life to save other people, right? So you you're very sensitive to their distress and their need, and you're going to work to prevent suffering. Uh, but you're going to have to do that wisely. So if I rush in and start trying to save people, then that wouldn't be very clever. If you think of the staff on the COVID wards who risked their lives saving patients, right, and they were very skilled because you have to be very skilled, they had a lot of courage and a lot of skill, a lot of wisdom, those two things together. So when people say, oh, well, compassion is sort of soft and weak, that's a fundamental misunderstanding of what compassion really is. It's the most courageous, the most wise motivation we've got. And compassion is what generates people to lay down their lives for others. I mean, there is absolutely nothing weak and soft about it. That's really incredible. It's really interesting when you highlight this courage and this wisdom and that they both they're both integrated in the experience of compassion and that there is this evolutionary thread that in terms of, for instance, in the parent-child relationship, the sense of nurturance and meeting needs of our young, that that's something we're wired to do. Yeah. And yet, you know, we can expand out to others and even perhaps back to ourselves. And I think that would be really interesting for listeners if you wouldn't mind sharing a bit about how compassion focused therapy really developed in the context of when you were um, a CBT therapist working with someone who was doing, um, I guess, you know, I don't know, was it thought challenging or they were um, developing an inner dialogue and you noticed that it wasn't necessarily effective because that key ingredient of compassion was missing. Would you share with us that story? Oh, yeah. So <clears throat> cognitive behavioral therapy, which sort of came in during the 60s, there was a whole raft of people. There was Albert Ellis and Tim Beck and, and others, um, really highlighted the fact that there is a link between what people think and what they feel. So Tim Beck, for example, noted that when people were depressed, they would have a negative view of themselves, negative view of the future, and negative view of the world. And he uh, worked with many clients to, if you could change that view, if you could help people see the world in a different way, interpret things in a different way, that didn't lock them into depression, because the problem was the negativity in the thinking locked you into negativity in your mood. But if you could break that loop, if you could help people stand back, and maybe take a more balanced view of themselves, a more balanced view of the future, would that be helpful? And sure enough, it really was. 
And so cognitive therapy really started with treating depression by helping people to look at their or balance their negative thinking. And people who are depressed tend to see things in black and white terms and so on. So that was that. And that was really pretty revolutionary. And uh, um, I, in Edinburgh, actually, they, Ivy Blackburn did the first trial of cognitive therapy in, in Britain. Um, so that was great. Um, <clears throat> and I was lucky enough to be part of that early stuff. But uh, my area was chronic and severe depression. And what we were finding was that you know, a number of clients could say, yes, look, I, I feel like a complete failure. I'm lovable. I shouldn't really be here. I'd be better off dead. On the other hand, I can stand back and I can realize I've got a caring family or I've held down a job or, you know, whatever. <clears throat> so there was a mismatch between their ability to cha change the way they were thinking, but not necessarily change this motivation of, and emotional texture of what they felt. So yes, I can change the way I think, but I still feel depressed. I still blah, blah, blah. So we hadn't changed the brain state in my, my way of thinking. The brain state was not being changed by this effort to balance thinking. So one day <clears throat> I was working with a very um, depressed lady who had had lots of therapy and had been in and out of the hospital. And she had been adopted and felt that she hadn't been wanted and shouldn't have been born. She had a very difficult um, adopted family as well. Um, but she had a good relationship with her partner, her husband, and she had lovely children who did very well at school and so on. And so she was able to stand back and say, look, I feel like this, you know, I just because of my background, I understand it's my background, but nevertheless, I just feel this sort of, I shouldn't really be here, I'm not really wanted. So one day I said to her, well, when you stand back and you look or you use these alternative thoughts, you can see if you take a balance view that your husband really cares about you, your children are doing great, you've been a wonderful mother. How do you hear them in your mind? You know, can you speak them out as you hear them, right? And she was a little embarrassed, but she said, as I actually hear them? And I said, yeah. So she said, okay. Come on, you're doing cognitive therapy, aren't you? you got a husband who loves you. you got three great children who care about you. You've had a job. I mean, I was shocked, right? The hostility was not the, the hostility in the, in, the, in the thinking was quite extraordinary. And uh, I suddenly realized it's not in the emotional, it's not in the cognitive channel that the problem is, right? You can do that. But if this emotional texture of those thinking is, is that hostile, like, come on, you can do this. Look at the evidence. And of course, that's a little bit what her background was. That's how her parents treated you. Come on, you won't, won't make it. So <clears throat> the obvious, I mean, it was pretty obvious uh, to say, okay, well, what about <laughs> if we change that emotional chain and make it kinder and really focus on a part of you that's compassionate, recognizes the pain you've been in with the depression, that you didn't choose that, and so on and so on. Let's see if we can do that. And she looked at me and she said, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing I've never been kind to myself. How on earth is that going to help me? I've just got to make myself believe this. I've just got to find a way I can force myself to believe this. Maybe there's more evidence. <laughs> so I said, well, maybe. Let's just try and use it change of emotional so just say the same things but can you generate a really friendly kind voice and uh she just sort of almost dissociated and said no mm. i can't do it and that was the second shock really that when i started to kind of do cft with these chronically depressed clients they couldn't do it and not only that they were quite hostile to it and <laughs> so that was yeah. kind of interesting so what it means is they can't use the caring system. All of the physiological aspects to do what we call the vagus nerve, which is part of your autonomic nervous system and a hormone called oxytocin, they can't use it. They can't access it, right? So that was interesting. Then the third shock, which I should have been aware of, is that <clears throat> all motivational systems have their own memory, all right? So, for example, if you like cheesecakes, and then one day you have a cheesecake and it makes you very, very sick. Um, next time you see a cheesecake, your memory for food will make you feel sick. Not your memory for what happened in an argument with your partner or blah, blah, blah. That memory will re-trigger your body experience for nausea. So, oh, God, not a cheesecake. Oh, God, right? So that's body memory, body memory for that situation, right? But every motivational system is the same. So you don't just get generally put off all food, you get put off that, right? 
So if you if you think that you like going on holidays, you love holidays, they excite you, and then one day you're on holiday and you get badly beaten up, the next time the concept of holidays are triggered, you're not going to remember all the nice things. You're going to remember the trauma. So trauma in holiday making, going away, leaving the house, you might become really quite anxious about that, but not other things in your life, right? So trauma tends to be context specific and motivational specific. Okay, so the big point is then, if you've got problems in your care system, if as a child you weren't cared for or you were abused or neglected or hurt, when we start to work with that care system, you're going to start activating those memories. And that's what we did. Not intentionally, but we started to notice that when people did start to be um, kind to themselves, one of the key things that opened up this extraordinary grief. Um, mm -hmm. And the lady that I was talking to when she did start to go down through some of the practices that I can talk about later, when she did start to use those practices, it put her in touch with a, a, a very deep sense of loneliness that she'd been grappling with all of her life. Now, the point about it is what it, it, at the root of many depressions is a deep loneliness and that people try to get out of that by maybe if I work harder, maybe if I was like this, maybe if I was more attractive, maybe if I did that, I'm such a failure and I'm so actually at the root of it underneath it all is this deep sense of loneliness and disconnectedness so when you begin to engage in that under the underneath level of loneliness and disconnectedness you run into a lot of grief and so in cft <clears throat> you know there are some forms which are teach people to be kind to themselves and so forth we don't do that because uh i mean it's a good thing to do later on but the first part is helping clients understand what compassion is, and we give them an example, so I can talk to you about it in a minute. But the key thing is realizing and helping them recognize that as they descend into caring, they will start to engage some of the emotional memories and the sense of loss and disconnection that's in that system. Okay, so that was the third thing. So the three things was seeing that it's the emotion and the self-criticism that's crucial, not and, and Leslie Greenberg and Tom Welton did some studies on that much later. And show that. That's the, first thing. the second thing is that when you try and switch people to compassion, some people to compassion, either they don't understand it or they don't like it. Yeah. Particularly if you focus just on kindness for some people, that, re that really freaks them out. And so you have to get into the courage and wisdom part. And that means helping them really take the courage to engage in this deep sense of loneliness that's, that's there. So it's a little bit tricky, that last stage, but that's kind of what CFT is about. Thank you for explaining in such depth for us, because I think that gives us a really good sense as to why courage and wisdom are yeah. so important in compassion-focused therapy and in your definition of compassion and why we didn't actually hear anything about kindness, albeit it sounds like it can come in you know, effectively at a later date, but really focusing on that courage is vital. I guess in, in sort of proceeding forward, you know, when you describe how grief might come up when we start kind of um, exploring what's going on underneath and what's sort of underneath some of the um, self-punitiveness and other behaviors, does this link with your concept of the tricky brain? Or would you mind like describing what the tricky brain is for listeners? Because I think this is relevant to understand too that you know, our brain doesn't necessarily, from what I gather, make it easy for us to be compassionate all the time. Yes, you're right, um, Caitlin. And your point about kindness is a very, very important one because kindness is extremely important in CFT. It's just that you have to be careful when and where because it helps, you know, when we're kind to people, which shows we're thoughtful, it builds relationships and relationships are really important things to do. So compassion is specifically about suffering. Kindness is really more about relationship building and happiness and flourishing, which is really important. But there are some wonderful therapies that do that, and we use those therapies as well. So that's a great point you made. So the thing about tricky brain, right, <clears throat> we have a brain that is prone to very much experience itself as itself. So you feel you are you, and I feel me and me, and the, the people who are listening or watching, they will feel they are them, you know, Bertie or Fred or whoever it is out there, hello. And you'll feel that you're you, right? But here's the thing that you've got to be careful about. Um, all of us never chose to be here. No living thing on this planet chose to be here. Okay, no elephant chose to be an elephant, no giraffe a giraffe, a lion didn't choose to be a predator, antelopes didn't choose to be prey, humans didn't choose to be humans, 
and you didn't choose to be female and I didn't choose to be male and I didn't choose to be a white male and I didn't choose to be born when I was born, and so on and so on. So we are all constructed and we are built uh, biological organisms in the same way that all life is built from DNA. And you have huge variety of patterns and textures because DNA builds it, right? All these different species. And 99% of all species have gone. I mean, they've gone extinct. They didn't survive, you know, wiped out by viruses or volcanoes or extinctions or whatever. So this is really quite an important point. If we stand back and we, find, we think about what are we? How did we get to be here? You know, why do I have a brain that's full of all this stuff? And uh, so we help our clients think about that. We say, how many chose to have two arms and two legs, you know? <laughs> okay, you didn't choose that. Did you choose to have a head that uh, you have to put food in one end and it comes out the other? No. <laughs> Did you choose to have a brain that can give you great joy and but also make you terrified? You can have nightmares with it, right? It gives you sexual feelings, but also it can make you very anxious, make you very angry. Did you choose to have a brain that can do the most horrific things, right? Humans are also an incredibly nasty, vicious species. I mean, if you look at our history, uh, of our wars and uh, tortures and how women are being treated and so on, slavery. I mean, we do not come out well, okay? And, and there are reasons for that, which we can talk about a little later. But what it means is that we have all got a brain built for us, not by us. We didn't build any of this stuff, okay? And it's tricky because the brain has been built as a survival and reproductive. You're an organism. You're here to come into existence, grow up for a little bit, decay and go out of existence. <laughs> yeah, I'm on the going out phase, unfortunately. So all living things, you know, and that is a compassionate position. All living things are in the cycle of life. They come into existence. They grow for a while, reproduce, decay and die. We are part of that cycle. We don't choose it. We don't necessarily want it. So that's key. So when you think about your brain, remember what you're feeling, whether it's a depression or anxiety. Remember, there are millions of people around the world that feel like you because they've got the same brain that you've got and you didn't choose, right? And so we help people realize that they don't choose to feel as they feel. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, you know what? Life's boring. I think I'll have some panic attacks today. That would be a bit of a weird No, panic attacks come. You don't want them. And, you know, it's so, awful. Or, yeah, I've been a bit bored. I think I'll have a suicidal depression for a day. That would be fun, won't it? No. No one chooses this stuff, right? But all of these brain states, they just come on. And, and then we have to figure out how we're going to work with them. And, and the, the courage and the wisdom now is my brain state has gone into an anxious pattern or a depressed pattern or a paranoid pattern. If I stand back from that, what is, is likely to be helpful to me? How can I be sensitive to the distress that's driving this brain state? What is the distress that's driving the state, state, which is usually some kind of fear or major loss? And what would really help me, okay? Because if I get caught up in self-criticism and running myself into the ground and calling myself names, I could do it, and many, many millions of people do, but it isn't going to be helpful to you. It will make you feel terrible because... If you attack yourself, then that those parts of your brain which are sensitive to being attacked, they start firing up, and then you will feel bad. So tricky brain is you didn't choose it. A lot of what goes on inside of you, you have no control over hardly at all. Um, and a lot of the brain states that cause you pain and suffering, you don't choose to experience those usually. Um, sometimes it causes excitement. You know, you want to get a bit of excitement. But generally we don't. So that's partly what we mean by tricky brain. And the other point that we say to clients is, look, if I had been kidnapped as a three-day-old baby into a violent drug gang, stolen from the hospital, um, I wouldn't be this poor girl. Well, it would be a very different version. You know, my, my, even my, the genes that are turned on and off in me, what's called epigenetics, would be different because we know that the genes that get turned on and off in people are very much linked to their early backgrounds the way your frontal cortex and your brain matures linked to background, caring versus hostile, caring versus threat. A big difference is on how people mature, how their brains mature and so on. So again, I wouldn't have chosen to be kidnapped as a three-day-old baby, but my, my creation of a sense of self, my version of me would have been created for me, not by me. Now, Okay, so the key thing is when we understand all that, that is what allows us the wisdom to step back. We now know what it is to be human. We are a, a 
a consciousness that finds ourselves here for a little bit, and then we can decide if that's a spiritual question or not. <laughs> so what am I going to do? Well, one of the things is I need to try to understand my mind. I need to. So the first thing then is to become mind awareness, and as you know, uh, mindfulness now, learning to pay attention to what goes on in your mind as it's happening is very, very important. So learning to pay attention to the mind with curiosity, not with attack. Okay, so if you find things in your head, right, you find impulses or feelings or whatever it is, they've been built for you. That you didn't build them. But it's a good idea to learn how they work, <laughs> and then they won't act out, right? If you find thoughts and and fears inside of you, don't own them, okay? You didn't create them. Your brain has created them, and your brain has been built from DNA, which has been evolving over millions of years. But because you have this conscious ability to pay attention, to observe your mind, you can start to choose. Now we do that all the time, actually. I mean, you think about taking your driving test, right? Then you can be incredibly anxious about that, but you choose not to act on that anxiety because you want to drive. So you stick with the anxiety and you do the driving test and then you pass and you're very happy. So we learn to override our emotions a lot, particularly anxiety and so forth. And part of what compassion is doing is learning not to act on emotions that are harmful to you or other people. Don't, you know, not to do that. Once you've made that decision, like, I definitely want to drive, and even if I'm very anxious, I'm going to do it. Once you make that compassionate decision, I'm going to live my life to be helpful, not harmful. That's the big motto in CFT and in Buddhist things as well. I'm going to live my life. And when I notice, I can notice when I'm doing things that are harmful to myself or others, I'm going to try as best I can to shift my thinking and my way of being to try to be helpful. Okay? Mm. Now, all of us get caught up in that <laughs> because, you know, we're always making – ideas about, you know, I'm, okay, I'm going to be really support. I'm, I'm going to go on a diet. I'm going to stop eating those pizzas, reduce my intake of wine or whatever. So you all have these intentions, but it's the courage and wisdom to follow them through. Um, that's the key element. So the firstly, have an intention. See, that's the first thing, that motivation, that motivation to care for yourself and people around you and the world that you live in, that's your intention. But you have a brain that will pull you away from that, that will make you angry or selfish or greedy. Or, okay, that's not your fault. That's not your fault. But just be aware of it. You know, you're trying to be supportive to yourself, but you have a brain that's telling you, no, you're useless, you're crap, you're no good. Okay, let's, you can see that. And remember, many millions of people have that. You're not the only one that have exactly the same kind of thoughts, negative thoughts about themselves that you do. But what you can do is to notice, okay, I notice this. I'm not going to own it, but I am going to work with it. And I'm going to try to think, okay, so how could I actually be helpful to myself, given I'm disappointed that I'm not the way I want to be or I've made a mistake or you know, I wanted to go for the job, didn't get it. So what is the most helpful thing for me to do now, right? That single question is, is such an important compassion question. Anyway, shut up now because I've been rabbiting on a bit. No, that's, that's beautiful. I, I, I don't want to jump in because there's so much wisdom here. You know, what can I do to be helpful, not harmful? And letting that be the guiding question as to how we treat ourselves and others. And what you described going on in our own brains where we can almost elicit our own fight or flight response when we're beating ourselves up, I think is really useful information in terms of, you know, where compassion comes in. It's not that we don't, you know, have difficult thoughts or feelings. It's how we then relate to this experience of being human and this tricky brain that none of us chose. And yet we're all navigating together. That's absolutely right. That's right. That's absolutely right. It all kind of, you know, I, I, there's a couple of threads I'd like to follow, but this really reminds me of the Buddhist Arrow Sutra. Um, is that something that you would share with clients? Yes, if they were that way inclined. So the Arrow Sutra is a good one, two arrows. So the first arrow hits you, you know, when you, somebody shoots an arrow at you. And then you've got all the pain and issues to do with that. You've got to get go and get treatment. So there's all the practical things to do with the reality of what's hit you. Oh, okay, so that's the first. And then the second arrow is your reactions to it. When you say, well, what, what, why are you shooting at me, the bastard? I'm going to get them all. Oh, no, look, this is going to really mess up, you know, my... I was planning to, to go to a football match and now I've been shot by an arrow. This I'm not going to be able to go. So there's a whole range of 
thinking about what the meaning and the implications of being hit by an arrow are. And in the Buddhist position, that gives you what is called dukkha. So in the Buddhist position, they distinguish between the inevitable pain of living, coming into the world, growing, decaying, dying. Those are the key steps in the Buddha's story. If you know the story of the, of the Buddha's journey of, of um, uh, sickness, decay, and death. Uh, so how do we deal with that, right? You know, do we become angry with it or do we, you know, all the setbacks in life, how do we deal with them? Because they will come, right? It's a little bit like learning judo, you know. One of the first things to learn in judo is how to fall. Because if you can fall, then you're okay. And we sometimes used to say in therapy, you know, um, I'm going to teach you how to fail. They say, what are you talking about? I've come here to be taught how to succeed. No, you haven't. Success looks after itself. If you don't know how to fail, that's what will stop you in your tracks. If you fall off a horse and you don't know how to get back on, that's your problem, right? If you, if you do something wrong and it all goes pear-shaped and you start beating the hell out of yourself, then you're not going to be able to get going again. So the most important thing is when times are hard, can you bring a light? Can you bring encouragement? Can you bring support? If you can do that, when times are difficult and it's not going well and you're really cocking things up, but you can still bring a sense of support and encouragement to yourself to try as best you can to resolve, that will help you. If, on the other hand, when you fail, you start going for the beat up job against yourself. That's really going to make it difficult for you now. Um, so don't make things more harder than they are. You know, life is hard enough as it is. You don't need to treat yourself harshly because that makes it really tough. Psychological judo and, you know, essentially compassion being the skill to help us fall. Wow, right? Have you considered how strong, you know, how courageous compassion is? I think that this is a really important way to understand and to frame the practice of compassion, to ensure that it is active, that we are showing up in the world. And I'm really excited for the next part of this interview, so tuning in again next week to explore these different flows, these different arms of compassion. And from there, we're going to be diving into the challenging side of humanity, that vengeful, that violent side, better understanding these parts of humanity so that we're not naive to them and so that we can ensure we are actively cultivating and seeding compassion in ourselves and our communities. Paul's going to also be guiding you through some compassion practices, practices to cultivate compassion in yourself. So please tune in next week for further wisdom. I look forward to dropping into your earbuds soon. I'm going to be waiting with slightly bated breath because this is such a wonderful opportunity to learn from Professor Paul Gilbert himself. All right. Bye for now. Thanks for joining us this week on the Wisdom for Wellbeing podcast. Please visit drcaitlin.com to connect, find show notes, other episodes, and to subscribe. While you're at it, if you find value in the show, we'd appreciate a rating or perhaps simply tell a friend about the show. Wisdom for Wellbeing is not a substitute for professional, individualized mental health treatment. If you are in crisis, please contact 000, your local emergency number if you are outside of Australia, or attend your local hospital ED.